chance to be able to share it with you tonight. Um, it is a fascinating subject and one that I think we have all so much to learn from and use even in our own backyards. Um, so I'm hoping you will all enjoy it. I know I'm looking forward to it. And thank you again, Colden, for doing this for us. And welcome. And I'll turn things right over to Colden. OK, thank you so much, uh, Sonia and Lindsay. Um, I will get up my slides real quick. All right, so uh, again, thank you everyone so much for coming here. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And I see, uh, I see lots of familiar faces on the call, which is, which is great. That's comforting. And uh, some new folks as well. So oh, I hope that uh, you enjoy what I have to say and have a good time at this talk. So as Sonia mentioned, uh, I did reach out uh, and offer this presentation. Uh, I was giving this presentation last semester as part of a naturalist outreach program um, to area or Ithaca area schools. And I was giving it to school children uh, K through 12. And I have ramped it up a little bit um, to give to a adult audience uh, at the suggestion of my professor from last semester to see if we could give, this, uh, give our programs to anybody in the community. So as Sony mentioned, uh, I'm a senior at Cornell University studying viticulture and plant science but I'm really passionate about sustainable agriculture practices and especially about science outreach. And I think that as wonderful as it is to learn about the, these sciences, the real value of, of the education I'm getting here comes through sharing it with others and bringing the practices to widespread use. So I'm happy to be here to share the principles with you. And I hope that as Sony mentioned, everybody learns something here today that they can take home and apply in their farms or gardens or just in their backyards. Uh, I got into viticulture after graduating from Candago Academy in 2017. And before that, I have volunteered with, I think, just one uh, Candago Lake Watershed Association program and had a lot of fun working with them. And I think the work they do at home is, is really wonderful. And now here at Cornell, uh, I previously worked as a research, research assistant in the vineyards. I volunteered for a regenerative agriculture project, and I've taken some courses about uh, food systems in the US and across the, the world. And I think these three uh, projects in particular have made me very aware of the broad impact that agriculture can have on society and on the environment, as well as the uh, immense power of science to impact agriculture. Um, and it just needs to be widely communicated and gotten out there to have the impact that it deserves. So let's get started with growing together. Uh, a look at how polycultures can not only create a cleaner environment, but produce a uh, but produce better food for people to live better lives. So today's presentation is going to have four quick parts. It's going to be a discussion on the independent ecosystems. And, or pillars of independent ecosystems and why they are important to farms and gardens. We're gonna have a brief overview of the prevailing agriculture system, agricultural systems today, and a guide to creating an independent ecosystem in your farms or gardens. And then we'll look at some ideas about getting started with a sustainable garden in the Finger Lakes. And while these principles uh, can certainly be applied to all agricultural settings, uh, large conventional farms is, uh, possibly, it's certainly easier to apply them on small scales, either in your home gardens or on new small farms. And I would just like everyone to uh, view it. If, if you're having a hard time picturing viewing these practices on a large scale farm, scale it back a little bit and ask yourself, how would it work in my garden at home? And as I said, I hope everybody gets some ideas to incorporate some of these practices today. So we'll start out looking at farms and gardens as independent ecosystems. And to do this, uh, I will ask a, a simple question and feel free, I, I should have mentioned this before, feel free to put some suggested answers in the chat. So what are signs that you look for to know that your farm or garden is healthy? And I'll wait just a couple moments to see if any answers come in through the chat here.
Thank you. Okay, so we have presence of insects and pollinators, uh, abundance of two pollinators. All right, I'm gonna move off this off to the side. So yes, presence of insects, but not insect pests, right? We want the presence of beneficial insects, which are commonly pollinators and or natural predators of the insect pest to provide biological control. Um, some other ideas that might be beneficial are you want your garden or farm to produce enough food uh, to reach your goal, or if you're a farmer, to be profitable at harvest. Uh, you want the garden to be resilient against pest pressure and environmental changes. Uh, you want this system to be repeatable year after year, whether it's in your garden and backyard and using the same space every year, or whether you're rotating fields and you want it to be repeated on a much larger scale after every crop rotation. So these, along with many other signs of a healthy garden, are all indicators of a high level of resilience in the ecosystem in your garden. And all of these things can be accomplished by human intervention. For example, in, in the case of insects, you can spray insecticide to get rid of the, uh, to get rid of all the insects. Or if you want to get rid of just the pest insects, you could import some uh, natural enemy predators uh, that you would buy from a company, and that would be uh, an in intervention action. But this would uh, cost money, of course, and it would be much more difficult than uh, uh, accomplishing these goals by creating an ecosystem that would naturally do it for you from the way it's set up. So what makes an ecosystem capable of providing these services for you? So there's three main things I would like to highlight. First is biodiversity. So biodiversity is of course a key factor in any ecosystem and can be directly affected by the grower uh, depending on the number of species that are planted, but can also be indirectly impacted due to the ability of plants to attract and repel certain insects. So we just mentioned uh, pollinators and pest insects. So certain plants can certainly attract pests, but also others can attract uh, predators and pollinators that you're looking for. Uh, and the goal is that by increasing biodiversity, you're going to fill every ecological niche possible so that pests and diseases don't have to for you. Competition is the next one and it's closely related to biodiversity. You want to have a high level of competition among your plants to encourage them to outcompete weeds. And you also want natural predators and neutral insects to outcompete pests. Uh, the same is true for microbes in the soil. Beneficial microbes such as mycorrhizal fungi um, can have some competitive effects against pests and diseases in the soil. And both of these things lead towards resilience of the system. I think personally that resilience in an ecosystem is the most important aspect uh, because it's a proxy for the sustainability of the ecosystem. And the more resilient, the longer it will last on its own uh, and the longer or the less impact it will have on the environment around it. So with these pillars in mind, Let's take a look at some of the common agricultural systems in use today, and we'll consider them through the lens of an ecosystem. So we'll take a look at these three systems, monocultures, polycultures, and permacultures, and we'll discuss their main advantages. So monocultures are, of course, very important uh, to our food system today. They produce uh, the vast majority of the world's food. Uh, and just to back up a second, I think most of us are familiar with these words, um, but in case anybody is unaware, a monoculture is just what we think of when we think of a farm. It's a large acreage of a single type of crop um, produced for commercial uh, sale. So yes, so monocultures produce the vast majority of the world's food, and they do that very efficiently. They're optimized for mechanization and for today's agricultural infrastructure. So by that, I mean that they can make efficient use of unskilled labor. There is a wide variety of mechanization options available uh, to, to perform a wide variety of very specific tasks for monoculture farms. And they're set up for brokers, distributors, and retails who are expecting to deal with a large amount of food of one kind from a single producer and not a wide variety of a small amount of different foods. Uh, the field design in monocultures is also ideal for some of the most important crops grown today. Uh, wind pollinated crops, which are the grains and grasses that provide most of our food, perform very well in a large field setting 
where the wind can easily, easily distribute uh, their pollen and produce high yields. However, if we think about monocultures as an ecosystem, because that is the focus of today's talk, uh, we see that it doesn't have a lot of biodiversity, which is the point, uh, right? You are trying to limit weeds and pests in a monoculture. And the crops are not strong competitors without the use of pesticides or against uh, one or two specific pests and or uh, pressures that they've been bred specifically to resist. And uh, kind of as a result of that, resilience is low. Uh, you can imagine that if a farmer were to leave his field, it would not come back uh, the next year, at least not in full force, because it's dependent on the farmer's actions. However, we can address some of these limitations through different agricultural systems. So a polyculture addresses some, but not all of the issues. A polyculture, uh, as you can guess from the structure of the word, is growing many different types of crops together in one field. So everyone is familiar with some classic examples of a polyculture. Think of the three sisters, of course, but this isn't just an archaic or uh, hippie practice. Uh, these are common in conventional farms. Um, for example, uh, Indian Creek Farm here in Ithaca has orchards uh, growing apples, uh, pears, and peaches together and cover crops planted either between rows or as a orchard uh, ground cover are common in, in uh, commercial production today. So polycultures increase biodiversity and competition in a system. Uh, inherently, it's a polyculture because you planted more than one crop, but also indirectly, because as previously mentioned, the results of your plantings can attract uh, different desired and undesired animals. So you want to design the crops that you are planting and the cover crops and companion plants to attract the animals, be it um, pollinating birds or insects or whatever else, to attract the animals that you're desiring. Polycultures can also increase soil health and carbon sequestration. So for example, uh, green mulches and cover crops when cut down, uh, or green mulches and companion plants can reduce soil erosion and different plants form different types of relationships with various microbes in the soil, specifically mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria. And cover crops, when cut down and tilled into the soil, uh, inc will increase the organic matter over time because they are, after all, made of carbon in the soil. And when done correctly, polycultures reduce the need for inputs of fertilizers and pesticides. Specific cover crops can increase soil fertility. Um, companion plants can improve biological control of pest diseases and weeds. And there's a reduced risk of fieldwide disease outbreaks simply because diseases are specific to certain species and are not likely to affect all the crops that you've planted in your polyculture. This is, of course, not just an environmental benefit. It also saves the grower the cost, the cost time, and equipment of conducting sprays. And finally, polycultures have the potential to be just as productive as monocultures. There have been recent studies that have shown that the three sisters, corn, bean, and squash, when grown together, have produced more calories and more grams of protein per acre than any of the three crops grown individually in a monoculture. So this is a surprising result, um, especially compared to people's expectations of organic and alternative sustainable agriculture methods but it has been shown to be true in at least one study. So this is great news for implementation of polycultures. And polycultures inherently and indirectly have increased biodiversity and competition, which are some of the pillars of an ecosystem that we've been looking at. But I would say that they have not inherently increased resilience compared to a monoculture because they're still dependent on a farmer or a grower to come through each year and replant or cut down cover crops and incorporate them into the soil. And so without this human intervention, uh, the system is not operating at its best. So this is why uh, there's, a, there's a need for an even more complex system. And this is where permacultures come in. So permacultures include the basic principles of a polyculture, and they have a focus on the long-term sustainability of the farm. And one way that this is accomplished is through the use of perennial plants. So with permacultures, you create habitats for pollinators and other animals. Um, well, so while the beneficial insects that you're looking for can live mostly on annual plants, 
um, birds, which provide uh, pollination services, as mentioned, and biological control of insects, typically need larger woody plants to uh, live on your farm. The perennial nature of the plants also reduces the annual planting and management expenses. There's obviously less cost for planting and hopefully less for tilling and spraying. And due to reduced planting and tilling, there's very minimal soil disturbances uh, where you, when you have perennial crops planted. And this can increase rhizosphere activity. It can increase carbon dioxide sequestered in the soil, increase organic matter over time, and allow fungal symbiotic relationships to grow stronger, as well as create greater microbial biodiversity in the soil. And as an added bonus, just as human immune systems strengthen over time with exposure to diseases, plants develop ontogenic resistance as they mature, which is the decreased susceptibility of older plants, as well as older plant tissue on the same plant, to disease. So think of this just as when a plant uh, tissue uh, grows older and hardens off and becomes woody, it is much more difficult for a fungus or a bacteria or an insect to get inside it and cause a disease. And so all of these um, factors and benefits of permacultures can help to make them a truly resilient system containing all that would be found in a natural setting while still producing food for the grower. So we've looked a bit at these systems in detail. And now I would just like to go into some specifics about how one can create a polyculture or permaculture system using common plants found in the Finger Lakes. So we'll discuss some tricks and strategies to create the greatest biodiversity and resilience in the garden. And I'll be discussing these four main topics uh, about it, or incorporating habitats, uh, attracting pollinators to the garden, using companion plants, and using a mix of annual and perennial plants, as well as different forms of annual and perennial plants in the garden. So we'll start off looking at habitats. Habitats are obviously important, as I just mentioned, to attract animals that might provide pollination and biological control in the garden. So some ideas for habitats that you might include um, on a small scale farm or in your garden include rocks, which provide shelter for many beneficial bugs, dense growths, which are, dense growths, which are beneficial for birds. They offer concealment and protection for these relatively larger animals. Um, ponds are a very important aspect of a habitat because water can certainly be a scarce resource and everything needs water to survive, these animals as well as your plants. So if you have a pond, this can not only increase the biodiversity of your garden, but you can save on your water bill by using it for irrigation of your crops. Leaving some dead plant tissue, uh, whether that's leaves, weeds, um, pine needles, or cut wood, can create a great home for decomposers, uh, these being worms, fungi, and bacteria. And uh, decomposers are very important for breaking down that plant matter and increasing the organic matter in your soil. Uh, and just to note, usually the fungi and bacteria that are doing this decomposition are not the same ones plant causing diseases. So there's little risk to uh, increase their populations. And a compost pile goes a long way to this same end. Uh, a few things not pictured on the slide, of course, are birdhouses and bird feeders, uh, long grass in your yard, and creating a layered effect in your garden, such as incorporating tall trees and other tall crops to break up the monotony of a sunny yard or sunny field with a bit of shade where animals can seek shelter from the heat. So companion plants are a bit of a more complex topic. Um, they provide um, biological control, but can also increase soil nutrients and attract pollinators. So some of these types of, of, of companion plants have been more well-researched and are more validated than others, uh, but I'll be sure to point out which are which. So the first uh, service that a companion plant can provide is that it can repel insects as well as mask the scent of your crops so that the insects cannot find them. So herbs and spices are great at this, especially strong scented ones like dill uh, pictured here or lavender. 
Um, and this is a particular topic that certainly needs a bit of more research uh, to find out whether it is valid in all situations and what herbs and spices are best for this service. And if there are specific pairings of companion plants and food crops that produce the best results. Um, other types of companion plants can serve as decoys and distractions for the, your, for the bugs because they're tastier to eat. So we usually refer to these as sacrificial plantings or buffer crops. And this is a pretty tried and true method that's been shown to work well. Uh, one of my favorites for using this is nasturtium pictured here. Uh, it's a popular plant among herbivores. And the best thing is if the bugs don't eat it by the end of the season, you can enjoy it yourself. One thing that has had limited success, and I'm sure anyone who's tried it has experienced the same thing, is planting certain types of companion plants to repel herbivores. Uh, for example, planting marigolds to repel rabbits or deer. It has limited success. And marigolds are also said to repel uh, nematodes in the soil, again, with limited success. So this is one field where more research is required to find plants that are better at, conduct, at repelling large herbivores in this manner. One area that has been well researched and verified is plants that emit poisons, uh, killing weeds near them, but not certain other plants. So this is called allelopathy. And allelopathy is, just as I mentioned, emitting poisons either from the roots or from all parts of the plant that can uh, suppress seed germination or in some cases outright kill a weed. So some common uh, crops grown here that are allelopathic are sunflowers and sorghum. But black walnuts are a particularly interesting example um, because the poison that they commit or emit called juggalone is not poisonous to plants that have co-evolved with it. So that means that any plant that is native to North America uh, or to this to, to the native range of, of black walnuts, which is the northern North American United States, are immune uh, to juggalone. So you can plant a black walnut tree in your garden, and you can plant uh, native trees around it, such as maybe cherries or maples, um, and you won't have to worry so much about invasive weeds. The next big category of, of beneficial things to put in your garden that we'll discuss are pollinator attractors. So these are also considered companion plants, but they obviously have a specific focus to them. So pollination is of course absolutely key to any fruit producing crop, but it's also essential to any other sort of crop that you will be replanting from seed the following year. So one of the most important things to consider in attracting pollinators to your garden is that you want to have a large quantity of flowers, but you also need a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. That's because flower form is very important and specific for many different kinds of pollinators. So for example, large flowers are great for attracting native bees, while smaller flowers provide food for flies, beetles, butterflies, and hummingbirds pictured here. And then in addition to a variety of forms, you will also want to pick a variety of flowers that bloom at different times throughout the year to provide a constant food source for all of the pollinators in your garden. It's also desirable to plant native wildflowers because these have over time formed natural partnerships with the natives insects and bird species. And planting exotic flowers uh, in your yard is of course very popular and they're very attractive to look at, but they may not provide food to native pollinators and they thus may not become effectively pollinated, which can be a problem if you're looking to derive some sort of uh, fruit or seed from that crop. You'll also want to consider the differences between the habitat requirements of uh, pollinators versus other beneficial insects and animals. So the example I've provided here is that native bees prefer to burrow into the ground or into some dead wood, which certainly varies from uh, living on the grasses or making nests like birds do. And probably the most important aspect of attracting pollinators to your garden is to limit pesticide use um, because this can disrupt the entire system of biological control and be particular, particularly harmful, of course, to the insects. So as the insects die, then the birds' diets are affected and the natural water supplies can become affected. 
And ideally, if the system is providing enough competition, then there should be a limited need for pesticides in the first place. So after you've incorporated all of those aspects to increase the biological control and overall resilience of the ecosystem in your garden, it's time to consider everyone's favorite part, which is of course, the food that you will be eating. So just as with companion plants, you want to have a wide variety of crops, keeping in mind um, what you want to eat, of course, at the end. So an interesting strategy for choosing the crops is to try to create a layered pattern, as I mentioned, uh, involving trees, tall bushes, and lower growing crops, which will maximize the photosynthetic efficiency and can therefore go towards increasing the biomass and the yield on a particular area of land. So to achieve this, one might uh, start out with planting a fruit or a nut tree at the center and in the top layer of the garden. Um, below that, creating a sort of a uh, tall bush layer and below that, a low layer bush area. And of course, you need to keep in mind the sunlight requirements of each of these uh, types of plants. Um, since most food crops will likely need um, partial to full sun, you'll want to create a sort of pyramid-like uh, structure to this garden so that everything gets enough sunlight. Whereas directly under the trees or tall bushes, you can plant some shade loving companion plants so that you're still getting uh, the full potential out of this area. And annual plants certainly still have a place in the garden. Uh, while they vary in height and size and need to be planted each year, that makes them ideal for putting towards the outer edge of the garden so that more intensive management practices such as planting can more easily be performed. And then on the very outer edge of the garden, kind of forming a buffer, as I mentioned before, is a great place for pest repellent companion plants. So finally, throughout the entirety of this gardening process, from planning to planting to harvesting, we want to keep in mind that our goal through all of these suggestions is improving the biodiversity, competition, and resilience of the ecosystem to create the strongest and most independent ecosystem that we can while still producing food for ourselves. So that concludes the recommendations that I have. And to wrap up, I would just like to give a bit of inspiration in incorporating these changes into your gardens or yards. I just want to say that, of course, everyone can be part of this change. Uh, whether you are a farmer, a gardener, or just someone that eats food. So polyculture and permacultures are great ways to produce food that is good for people and for the planet, but there are many more awesome ways that we did not talk about, and sustainable agriculture is a growing area with far too many topics to cover in one lecture today. So the implementation of polycultures and other sustainable practices will of course have to be widespread in order to create changes in the environment and the food system. And farms will be the cornerstone of implementing these changes because of their size and number and importance in the agricultural industry. However, anyone can be part of this effort, as I said, and changes can be easily implemented uh, right away in gardens, probably with, um, because it's more easy to make a rapid change from one season to next in simply what you've decided to plant in your garden. So gardens are going to be an important component for universally employing and normalizing sustainable agriculture practices uh, throughout communities. And even if you're not a grower of any kind, you can still influence these changes through your shopping routine, shopping at farmers markets, uh, signing up for CSAs, co-ops, or any other sort of direct-to-consumer markets are great places to find sustainably farmed produce. And I would just like to share a list of resources and recommended reading. Um, there's a lot of information out there on this topic, of course, uh, ranging from academic papers to books to easy to understand how to internet articles. And these, if you're interested in really diving into the subject, of course, I recommend these books, Restoration Agriculture and Polyculture Management are both great. If you wanna fact check some of the things I said, of course, dive into the scientific literature. I provided a few resources here, um, mostly talking about the benefits of biodiversity in farms, but also a little bit of a look at autogenic resistance and the yields that are possible in polycultures. And then 
If, as I hope you are, you want to incorporate some of these ideas into your gardens at home, then you can use any of the resources I have here, but you can easily go on and Google whatever topic you're interested in and find lots of great implementation recommendations for your garden. And if, if anyone needs wants access to some academic journal articles, I am happy to provide it to you. You can simply email me with my email address on the next slide, and I will send you a PDF. So just to say it one more time, everyone can be part of this change, whether you're a farmer, a gardener, or just an eater. And thank you all so much for coming tonight and to listen to my speech. And thanks especially to Sonia and to Lindsay for helping me to set up this presentation. And lastly, to the Canada Lake Watershed Association as a whole for making it possible. And I hope you have some questions. Uh, and Sonia will be helping me to moderate the Q&A uh, portion of this talk. So thank you so much. That was awesome, Colden. Thank you so much. I mean, I think we've learned a lot about building healthy habitats in our backyards, companion planning, attracting pollinators, which is all very much in concert with, I know, a lot of the efforts that the CLWA is trying to encourage our members to take. So appreciate you diving into those tonight with us. So as, as Colden mentioned, uh, we're happy to take questions and you can type them in the chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And while we wait for that, um, I did share a resource in the chat as well about a week of upcoming events um, that kind of builds upon this topic. Uh, it's going to be the Finger Lakes Lake Friendly Living Week. It's going to run May 2nd through May 8th. I put a link to the landing page, which has another uh, series of really great events, all focused around creating healthy backyard habitats, um, healthy landscaping and lawn care practices. So feel free to check those out. And we hope you'll join us for some of those presentations as well. You're getting some positive feedback here, Colden. Nice job. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jill. That was wonderful. Thanks, Colden. <laughs> and Colden, maybe while, while we have you here, do you want to type in your email address right in the chat feature so people can have it handy in case they wanted yeah. to follow up on any of those resources that you provided? Certainly. Great. And we do have one question here. What crops do not work in permaculture? Mm -hmm. So I think a an instance uh, would, of course, be some, uh, well, I'm thinking of like fairly aggressive crops. Um, I know at home we've got a lot of mint planted. And when you have an ecosystem that has a lot of, that has, that's relying on the balance of the many different crops that you have planted, uh, you don't want to plant anything that's invasive or has invasive ha habits to it. Um, so, for example, the mint that I've planted at home is something that really just takes over everything and even outcompetes the weeds, which is desirable to some extent. But if you're trying to create uh, an ecosystem that maintains itself in the way you set it up, you don't want to have any plants that outcompete uh, your others way beyond anything that's, that's reasonable. Um, I think that unfortunately, uh, what, what I study grapevines are another very uh, rapacious crop with an invasive tendency that can be difficult to incorporate in, into, um, into permacultures because in, in their natural form and really even in their uh, in commercialized form, if they don't have the proper management, they will grow over everything and they'll take out your other crops. So I would say that you need to keep in mind uh, what crops are kind of um, you know, fairly well domesticated and can easily grow with others. And Sonia actually has a question that kind of builds upon that. You mentioned that sunflowers prevent some types of weeds. Do they affect crops as well? Yeah, so I'm not sure about the specific um, effects of sunflowers and which crops they affect, um, but I'm 
I am, I know that most crops um, that have allelopathic tendencies um, have certain ones that they will grow with. So in, in most cases, as with the, the black walnut, it will affect your crops if you plant a crop that is um, unfamiliar and thus susceptible to its allelopathic chemical. But if it's a crop that is co-evolved with the walnut tree, then it is uh, unaffected. Okay, great. A um, couple more questions here. Do you recommend adding a certain kind of compost or manure to soil of a garden? Yeah, I, I don't really recommend any particular kind of soil or compost or compost or manure. Um, really, any sort of compost that has been well composted and uh, broken down any potential um, contaminants in it is going to have the same effect. And uh, same thing with manure. Uh, well composted manure is, of course, more desirable than uh, raw manure um, because it has less potential to um, over over fertilize the soil and it is more likely to be well incorporated into the soil. Um, but really, uh, all organic matter is the same at the end of the day. And if it's gone through a composting routine, it's going to be beneficial and increase the uh, organic matter and maybe some of the other nutrients in the soil. Great. Um, can you speak at all to no till farming? Does that mean? you should not turn over soil before planting. Mm -hmm. So no-till farming is something that's increasing in popularity and is has shown to uh, have some really great results uh, both in yields and in um, environmental impact. So basically, yes, it does mean that you should uh, not turn over all of the soil before planting, but uh, to turn over as little as possible um, in order to get your crops into the ground. So if you are planting um, a vegetable crop and using plugs, um, that would mean that, yeah, you simply skip the tilling process and go straight to the uh, planting process. And same thing with field crops. Uh, you can go straight to, um, if, the, if the field uh, allows it and it is, is uniform enough, go straight to using the seed drill uh, without any tilling. And in certain crops, I'm familiar with a study in, in beans that has shown that they grow just as well uh, with no-till as with tilling. And this, of course, um, as I mentioned, saves a lot of the microbial life in the soil and can uh, improve uh, organic matter and fertility over time. Oh, here's, this is another really great question from Maura Toole. Um, in your research, do you have any thoughts as to where New York State is for this type of practice compared to other states? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, through basically just through reading articles coming from other parts of the country, um, there's a clear leader in this sort of uh, ideas, and it's of course California. Um, but New York has a lot of uh, great work in this as well. Um, I would say that it tends to, well, it, it tends to follow uh, a bit with the, the presence of large universities uh, in that state. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so there's, there's a lot of great work coming out of, of Cornell and uh, Cornell Agritech uh, regarding these sorts of ideas. Um, and there's certainly a lot coming out uh, of California and UC Davis as well. Um, but I would say that these processes are also maybe more popular um, across the pond in Europe. Um, there's a lot of great studies from there. And the, the only caution I would have is that uh, the apl applicability of studies from other regions in general is fairly good, but cannot be wholly uh, relied upon. So you might not get the same results from a study from elsewhere as you would from one in New York. Great. And to kind of build upon that, um, you mentioned the work that's being done at Cornell. Can you think of any models in the Finger Lakes region that are that are doing this type of work? This, the, you know, different farms or agricultural programs that you know of outside of Cornell that are real leaders in this in the Finger Lakes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a few local examples uh, that I'm familiar with here in Ithaca are one that I mentioned is Indian Creek Farm. Um, they're a conventional farm but they farm a wide variety of crops in close proximity. 
Uh, I mentioned their orchards, but they also have um, berry patches and vegetable gardens. Um, and they specialize in direct-to-consumer scale uh, sales, which allows them to sort of have this focus on smaller quantities of a wide variety of crops and, and to use these sort of uh, best practices for sustainability. Uh, there is uh, the, the regenerative agriculture project that I volunteered with is called Three Story Farm. And it is not yet um, up for commercial production because it takes a long, long time for these perennial crops to mature to the level where they're producing um, produce. Um, but they are a great resource for education and learning about these, uh, act, these practices. And in the future, they are hoping to uh, have harvest and to sell direct to consumer as well. And yeah, and those are some really strong examples that I can think of uh, from this region. Great, thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm happy to hear that you also gave this talk to, to it sounds like some school age children. Um, was there a lot of interest there amongst that, that group? Yes, absolutely. It, it's a pleasure to, to work with small children um, because they have something to say about everything that you have to say. <laughs> and I really appreciated their enthusiasm and their desire to learn more about the topic. And I think it was motivating uh, to learn that this was something that was of interest to people, um, even, of, even of a very young age. So it made me inspired to, to keep working at it. Very cool. And you're inspiring the next generation. So thank you for that. Um, I think that was all for the questions. If, if you have if you have any remaining questions, get them in the chat feature here. Um, I really I want to thank you so much for sharing this this uh, information with us tonight. Really well organized and put together. Super impressed. Um, we we really want to wish you all the best and uh, when you when you head out west and in your uh, in your next career move. So um, I just. We're happy that you've been able to provide this information to CLWA and you have hometown roots. So, so you're welcome back anytime when you have more information to share. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, Colden put his email address um, in the chat feature. So feel free to follow up with him if you have any questions. Um, one last question that came in, or maybe it's, Maybe it's a statement. Hey, you may have visited Mueller Field Station while you were in high school. I work at Mueller as the conservation education coordinator, and I'm working with a permaculture consultant to design a pretty large garden. Thanks for the talk. That's from Ali Esposito, who, who works with Mueller Field Station. That's wonderful. South end of Honeyway Lake. Yes, I have visited there for some uh, projects in, in college, uh, and it, it's, it's a wonderful place. It's very cool. And Allie and the folks over at Mueller do a really great job putting some virtual events together as well. So make sure you, you follow them on Facebook and, and check out their website as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much, Colden. Um, great job. We loved having you and you're welcome back anytime. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone.